now so that everyone knows. It's perfect. All right, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today I'm happy to be introducing Mike Coughlin. Mike got his bachelor's degree at Temple University in Philadelphia. He is now a fifth year grad student at the University of New Hampshire, where he works with Dr. Amy Keese. He's currently working as part of the NSF funded Magician Project, which we heard a little bit about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the project currently focuses on using machine learning techniques to study geomagnetically induced currents. So today I'm happy to have Mike here to talk to us about ground magnetic perturbation predictions using machine learning and interpretability methods. Mike, if you'd like to take that away. Sure, thank you, Kyle. Uh, yeah, I have trouble with that word all the time. That's that that gets me. Uh, I'm sure it'll get me in this talk a little bit later. So yeah, thank you, Kyle, for the introduction. Um, like you said, my name is Mike Coffin. I'm a grad student at the University of New Hampshire, and today I'm going to be talking about ground magnetic perturbation predictions using machine learning and interpretability methods. Um, before I begin, I want to thank all of my co-authors listed here, uh, as well as you, Kyle, for the chance to present uh, to everyone here today. Um, and as Kyle said, this work is done as part of the Magician Project, uh, as was the presentation a few weeks ago by Jeremiah Johnson, which I would encourage you all to check out on the seminar's YouTube channel um, if you didn't get to see his talk live. Um, and while Jeremiah has done some fantastic work on auroral classification, my focus is on ground magnetic field perturbations, as you can you know, see from the title. Um, throughout the talk, I'll mention quite a few complementary or really supplementary uh, talks and papers uh, that are a good expansion on this work um, in case, you know, anybody's looking for um, some more open tabs of unread papers to add to your computer, as I always am. Um, okay, so let me stop stalling and <laughs> dive into the work here. So uh, here's an outline of what I'll be talking about today. I'll start by introducing some of the background, including geomagnetically induced currents and how they motivate this work as well as how the localization effect we see in DBDT can complicate some aspects of forecasting. Then I'll jump to the specific methodology we used, some problems we've run into in the past and how we've changed our approach to address them. Um, and I'll talk about the machine learning model we use in this work, which is something called a convolutional neural network. Uh, and I think it's really important that we start kind of demystifying these models. So I'll spend some time explaining how these work. And then I'll talk about the results. Um, first, the direct results we got from the model, then about how we use some of these interpretability methods uh, to explain why the models are making the predictions that they're making. Uh, and then finally, I'll go over some metrics we use to evaluate how well these models are performing. So let's get into that introduction. And first, uh, let's start with the geomagnetically induced currents or GICs. So whenever we get currents flowing through the ionosphere, the basic tenets of the ENM tell us that we will get an induced magnetic field. Now, of course, the Earth has a magnetic field already, but this induced field will change the magnetic field we measure on the ground. Now, when this DBDT interacts with the Earth's surface, it will induce an electric field, where this Z variable here is something called the impedance tensor, and it contains the information about the conductivity and resistivity of the Earth. Uh, now, if that induced electric field interacts with any long conducting infrastructure, your power lines, pipelines, rail lines, etc., it can cause a current to flow in the infrastructure itself. Uh, this is the GIC equation, um, and this GI or these GICs can cause uh, something called half cycle saturation in power transformers uh, at the end of those power lines. It can accelerate the corrosion of pipelines and interfere with train railway, sig uh, railway signals, uh, none of which obviously sounds good. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures in a moment, um, but we're talking about the possibility of some serious damage here. Uh, now, in terms of our work, we're not looking to forecast the GICs directly for a few reasons. One is that we don't have a ton of actual GIC data, um, but even if we did, these two terms in the GIC equation, this A and this B over here, um, these are called network coefficients. They're dependent on the network configuration of whatever infrastructure we're talking about. So if that network infrastructure were to change in any way, the model we trained using the old configuration could be not applicable to the new configuration. Um, so we don't focus on that. And we don't focus on the induced E field either, though this one we are certainly uh, considering. Um, 
back when I first started on this project, there were not a ton of great, uh, there wasn't a ton of great coverage of the ground conductivity maps that we would need to transform the DBDT we measure into E-field data. Um, since we don't have a lot of E-field data directly, but we do have a lot of DBDT data. Um, I believe this has improved a lot in the past few years, so it's something we are we could conceivably move towards doing in the future. Um, but we focus on DVDT both because it is much easier to measure, so there's the larger databases stretching back uh, decades that we can use. Um, but more importantly, from a science perspective, the fluctuations in the ground magnetic fields are interesting in their own right. Um, but as it turns out, DVDT is a reasonable proxy to use for GICs anyway. Uh, this figure is from Hutton and et al. from 20, or I'm sorry, from 2002. Uh, the top panel here is the uh, GIC measured at a natural gas pipeline, I believe in Finland. Uh, and the bottom panel is the northward component of DBDT measured at a close by ground magnetometer station. And even just by eye, you can see how well these spikes in DBDT uh, correlate with the GICs in the pipeline, or the measured spikes in the GICs in the pipeline, I should say. Uh, now, this is just one example, but there have been other works done looking at the correlation between DBDT spikes and measured GICs. Uh, and there's certainly some work that shows that to more fully capture the GICs, we do need to take into account the ground conductivity profiles, and that is absolutely true. Um, but for our purposes here, the DBDT serves as an adequate proxy for these GICs. Uh, before we move to talk on uh, talk more about the DBDT, I do want to show uh, some of the damage that could be caused by these GICs. Uh, here's a few images you probably have seen before, but on the left is a power transformer in South Africa that was damaged by GICs during the 2003 Halloween storm. And the right image is another transformer in New Jersey that saw um, some serious GICs during the 1989 storm. Um, the same one that I'm sure you all are aware knocked out the power uh, from or in Quebec for quite a few hours. Uh, and these are obviously not small pieces of infrastructure, as you can see by the very convenient scale person in this picture right in the center over here. Um, so understanding and predicting the underlying phenomena that causes these is critical to preventing some of the damage and the costs incurred in fixing it and the disruption they can cause. Because you obviously, you know, even if it's not uh, costly for you personally, or uh, doesn't cause any damage to like your home, losing power in Quebec in March uh, is probably not a great thing to, to have happen. Okay, so onto the DVDT. Um, now the typical and extreme values of DVDT will vary uh, with magnetic latitude. And what you're seeing here is the 99th percentile value of DBDT at a series of ground magnetometer stations from the SuperMag network. This is not all the stations in SuperMag. Uh, my fellow grad student here at UNH, Raman Mukundan, identified stations with uh, the most continuous data sets going back to at least 1995. And those are the stations you're seeing here. I think it's 44 or 48 uh, stations in this plot. Um, but we can pretty easily see that the 99th percentile values are relatively low at the lower latitudes down here. Um, and they increase at mid-latitudes and really spike between 60, or I'm sorry, yeah, 60 and 75 degrees uh, MLAT. Uh, and this is right around the rural, rural oval, um, which we most often see, is where we most often see the electrojet currents. So this is not, you know, too, too surprising. But the DBDT values at the middle and lower latitudes can still be uh, enough to cause these GICs. Uh, and in fact, the two pictures I just showed you in the last slide uh, are at both lower latitudes. Uh, South Africa is somewhere in the 30s, and that New Jersey station, I think, is in the 40s somewhere. Um, now, what's also important here uh, is that we have a lot more infrastructure at these middle latitudes because that is where we start to see uh, larger population centers. Um, so for this work, we are focusing on this region between 50 and 60 degrees MLAT. All right, so we want to do a forecast uh, of when and where we'll see these large DBDT events. But here's we, where we need to talk about data sources and one of the more interesting characteristics of DBDT observations. Large DBDT can be a highly localized phenomenon. This is something we have observed for some time. 
This figure on the right serves as a really good example of this. Um, this is a figure from Nguira et al.'s work from 2018 that looks at a set of magnetometers in Western Canada and Alaska during the March 9th, 2012 storm. And they found that the peak DVDT value at one station, this pink one here, if you can see it, uh, it was about four times higher than any of its neighbors. Um, and this is, a, this is a really fantastic paper. I am really just skimming over this. Uh, I would encourage you all to go read it. But in essence, they suggest that the differences in DBDT measurements are caused by different ionospheric and magnetospheric processes. Uh, and they say that you know more work is required to fully understand uh, the drivers of these differences. Another study by Dimmick et al. from 2020 looked at something similar. Uh, they defined a parameter called region to specific difference or RSD that quantifies the differences in DBDT observed between stations in close proximity to one another. Uh, it does this by essentially comparing the DBDT measured at one station to the average DBDT calculated at all of the other stations in the region around it while removing that one station from the calculation of the average. So it's just a comparison between the one station and all of the other stations. Uh, and now what's particularly interesting from a forecasting perspective is that in looking at this RSD parameter, they found that it was well correlated with several solar wind parameters. Uh, and here's a plot from this paper that shows the max RSD values measured for a region in Scandinavia on the x-axis in log scale. And then on the y-axis is the solar wind BZ. And as you can see pretty clearly here, there's this trend of declining BZ with increasing RSD. Here's another plot from the paper that shows the 3D distributions of RSD as a function of both solar wind BZ on the y-axis here and the X component of solar wind velocity on the X-axis. Uh, and as you can clearly see, the distribution of increasing RSD for negative BZ uh, and increasing VX. Uh, and in fact, these black diamonds you see uh, are the 99.99th percentile RSD values. And all of them occur during southward BZ and most of them occur for higher VX values. Um, so we know these localization effects occur and that they correlate well with solar wind parameters. Uh, and this is a big problem for forecasting models that are heavily or exclusively reliant on solar wind parameters for making predictions of DBDT at particular magnetometer stations or multiple magnetometer stations close to each other. Um, because they're you, or the models are using uh, the same input data to predict a phenomenon, this DBDT, whose variation, the localization, in a small spatial area correlates with those inputs. Uh, now, we can obviously say that if this RSD is being caused by one station repeatedly seeing higher spikes than its neighbors, maybe because of total recurrence uh, or something like that, our models trained for those stations should be able to adjust for that to capture the higher DVDT seen at that particular station that's causing all of these RSD spikes. Um, but it unfortunately may not be that easy. Um, this is another plot from the same paper um, by Dimmick et al. Uh, and this looks at these stations in the region they examined were responsible for the highest RSD values. Uh, now we can see that one station in particular, this MAS station right here, is responsible for the most maximum values. Um, but all of the other stations in the region show high count numbers as well. And in fact, if you sum up the count numbers of all the other stations, they are equal to or slightly higher to just this one station right here. Um, so that means that obviously these Tellur currents play quite a bit of a role, but they're not enough alone to tell kind of the whole story here. So uh, solar wind data alone basically may not be enough to predict the DBDT phenomenon if we're looking at these small scales, um, given that that localization effect correlates with solar wind parameters. Uh, we may need additional, more localized sources of that information. Now, I should say that we do still use solar wind data in this work. I'll kind of go through all of that in a few moments. Um, and I had to adjust this wonderful figure from Noah here uh, to not show Discover, but ACE uh, at that point, because that's what we're using for, for our work here. Okay, so that was the introduction. And I'm going to go on to some of our methodology here. So. To start with, um, DBDT varies quite rapidly. And this rapid variation in this parameter makes it quite difficult to predict directly. 
Um, this is an example of some of my group's past work on direct prediction. And the blue line that you see in each of these panels, uh, these are three different magnetometer stations. This is a NEW, OTT, and WNG. Um, this blue line is the DVDT measured at these stations. And the red line is the output of an artificial neural network uh, that was trying to predict the DVDT. Uh, and as you can see, while the neural network can capture a lot of the general trends of the storm, it gets, you know, this peak right here and this peak right here in this plot. Um, it does miss a lot of the variability in the real data, and it underpredicts a lot of the magnitudes of most of these larger spikes. Uh, now, there's a few different ways we can attempt to address this. We can take the data augmentation approach, which actually we have already started to do in the results you see here. Um, this model was trained on a storm time only data set that we developed, which removes a lot of the or the problems with the quiet time bias that we've seen. And I'll go through that process in a few, uh, few slides from now. Um, and this does help significantly, but we can kind of continue going down this route by doing different undersampling and oversampling techniques to try to correct, you know, especially that uh, problem with under predicting the magnitude. Uh, and I think that's certainly worth us pursuing at some point, but for now we've decided to do something slightly differently. Um, so zooming into one of these panels as just an example, this is the OTT, the Ottawa ground magnetometer station from the previous slide. Um, what we're doing instead of direct prediction is setting a threshold value and determining whether these DBDT values go above that threshold or not. So if we were to set the threshold here, then all of these points here uh, in this kind of main part of the storm, as well as some of these down here, uh, would or that fall in this that, that go above this line into this shaded region uh, would be considered crossings, while the other ones would not. This turns this much more difficult regression problem into a binary classification problem while still preserving a lot of the information that we want to capture from a forecasting perspective. We want to capture these large spikes that can really cause uh, the damage for GICs, um, and this can still kind of do that. Okay, so uh, if we're looking to make a prediction at time t, if this is our, if this is our timeline up here, uh, if we're looking to make that prediction at time t, we're using 30 minutes of time history as input to the model. Now, we landed on this number after some brief testing of different time histories. Uh, and in fact, 30 minutes was actually not the uh, best one. It's not the one that minimized the loss the most. Um, that was actually 45 minutes, but uh, it was a marginal difference uh, and it increased the training time by about 50%. So uh, we stuck with the, the 30 minutes of time history. Uh, and thinking back to GICs, in order for a forecast like this to have any sort of use, we want to ideally have some sort of lead time in the prediction. So if there was some sort of risk of an event, something could be done to prevent some of the damage. So in that vein, uh, we're using a 30 minute long prediction window starting 30 minutes into the future. So at a time T, we're using the previous 30 minutes of data to determine if the DVDT goes above the threshold value anywhere in that prediction window. Um, and we're going to do this at a few ground magnetometer stations. These are the ones that we've chosen. There's eight of them here. There's the VIC and NEW in the Western US and Canada, OTT and STJ in Eastern Canada, LER and ESK uh, in far Western Europe, I guess, uh, and then BFE and WNG kind of in Central Northern Europe. These are chosen for a few reasons, uh, one of which is that they fall within that sub-auroral range that I showed you in one of the first slides. All of these have uh, an average MLAT between 50 and 60 degrees. Uh, and additionally, they span about 9 MLT, so we can see the effect of the testing storms that we uh, will show you in a little bit uh, across a large MLT uh, band, so we can see how they, they, uh, that affects the, the models. Um, these stations also have relatively continuous data sets that overlap really well with the ACE data from uh, 98 to 2017 um, that, we're, that we're using for this work. Um, and there are still a few gaps, which you'll see in some of the results, um, but overall, they're relatively continuous. Um, okay, so we have our stations. We need to talk about the actual thresholds that we're going to use, because I have not talked about that yet. So in searching for a place to start with defining these thresholds. Uh, the GEM challenge from 2013 is actually a pretty good place to start. Um, it defined a few different thresholds for evaluating the performance of models like this, um, the lowest of which is 18 nanoteslas per minute. Uh, now, the thresholds that were set out in this 2013 paper um, 
by Polkanen et al. were set to garner a statistically significant number of threshold crossings for the stations they were examining in that work. Um, but that included a mix of high and mid-latitude magnetometer stations. Uh, and when looking at mid-latitude only, uh, it becomes quickly obvious that even the lowest of these thresholds, this 18 nanoteslas per minute, doesn't really fit that objective. These are the percentiles that 18 nanoteslas per minute corresponds to for each of the stations that we're looking at. Uh, and as you can see, these are really high, uh, well above 99th percentile thresholds. And this is really a problem for machine learning models um, because we need as much data as possible to be able to uh, train these models. And this is really restricting what we would consider positive target data um, for this kind of thing. So we're going to stick to the 99th percentile value at each of the stations as a threshold. And these are the values in Tesla's per minute for all of those uh, stations here. And this just gives us more training data to work with while we can still identify events that are significantly elevated from the baseline values at these stations. All right, so we have our stations, we have our thresholds. Let's talk now about the actual inputs. So I mentioned before that we need additional inputs or we could need additional inputs beyond just the solar wind data um, to capture the localization effect uh, and to just generally make the predictions a little bit better. Uh, so to see how this additional data affects the model performance, we're going to be looking at two different types of models. One that uses solar wind data as input or the solar wind model, and one that includes ground magnetometer and indice data as well into the model. Um, because this model combines the solar wind and ground magnetometer data, I have cleverly taken to calling it the combined model. Uh, and now a couple of things to mention here. First off, the solar wind model does include positional information about the magnetometer, this sine and cosine of MLT right here. We did this because we're trying to examine the effect of adding the ground mag data, not the effect of where an MLT the station is located, um, because we can see very different ground magnetic responses at different MLTs. So, um, so we included that in the solar wind model to remove those possible effects from our analysis. Uh, and additionally, and here's the bigger one, we're using DBDT itself as an input in the combined model. Uh, now, even though we're not doing the regression problem of predicting uh, DBDT directly, uh, it was used to create the binary target data. Uh, so there is kind of this, this concern that the combined model having access to this information in some way, shape, or form could turn into something of a persistence model. So the model could learn that the best way to minimize its loss is just to output one when the DBDT in the input exceeds the thresholds and zero if it doesn't. So to make sure that the model is learning more complex behavior than that, uh, we will be comparing all of the results that we have to a persistence forecast that does just that. It will output one if the DBDT in the blue input time history here uh, exceeds the threshold and then zero otherwise. Okay, so I teased. A little bit earlier, but I'm going to briefly discuss how we select the training data. Um, this plot on the right is the SIMH uh, of one of the periods of activity we segmented that I'll use kind of as a demonstration here. Um, so first we identify periods where SIMH drops below minus 50 nanotesla uh, for a minimum of two hours. Uh, we then take those segmented periods and if there are storms that occur close to each other, we combine them into one event. Uh, and then identify the point of minimum SIMH during each storm. Uh, and then we save the timestamp so we can kind of play with that a little bit. And we actually have this, um, the list of all of these timestamps if anybody is interested in it, because it's proven quite useful. Um, and then for this work specifically, we ended up taking 12 hours ahead of that minimum point and 24 hours after it, and then added that all to the training set. And then if we apply this across the ACE and SuperMag data that it's available from uh, 98 to 2017, it gives us 397 storms that fit the criteria after we remove the eight storms we selected for testing. Um, and at one minute resolution, this results in about 850,000 total samples uh, for each station, which should be sufficient uh, for training our models. And now the breakdown of the data is important here. So let's take a quick look at how segmenting the data like this can kind of affect the DBDT distributions uh, for our training and testing and all of that. Um, so this is a plot of the DBDT profiles for the eight magnetometer stations. Uh, the squares are the mean values and the triangles are the standard deviations. Uh, 
The blue values are the distributions for all of the data between 98 and 2017. That's before we segmented any of the data. Uh, the yellow is the data we did segment for training using the method I just described, and the green are the storms we selected for testing. Uh, and as we can see, the mean and standard deviations all increase as we go through these three classifications. This may sense, make sense for the first two. DVDT is enhanced during active periods, uh, but the continued increase uh, for the testing storm certainly reflects our bias a little bit for wanting to examine the most extreme events, but we wanted to keep uh, consistent with some of the other literature. Um, there are also some differences that we can see between the stations once we segmented the training and testing storms. Some stations have higher distributions than others, and this generally, but not completely, follows the positions in uh, MLAT. Um, and there's one more thing uh, after this I need to address before I can talk about the model. Um, so when training these models, we use both a training and validation data set. The validation set is used during the training process to prevent overfitting, which is when the model loses its ability to generalize and sorts of, or sort of uh, starts memorizing the data set instead of actually learning the patterns in the data. Um, now, the data in the validation set is withheld from the data used to actually train the model. And if there are slight differences in what data is used to train versus validate the models, this could affect the model's final uh, performance. So. Here we trained 100 different models, each of which has a unique and shuffled training validation pair set. Um, we then take the mean of the models as the final model output, as well as the 95th percentile of all 100 models to present a kind of uncertainty or range in the results uh, from the differences in these training and validation pairs. Uh, we do this for a few reasons. One is that um, this type of ensemble modeling tends to outperform singular models for, that's true for a variety of different model types. Um, and additionally, because these are very data-driven models, we want to be able to present that kind of range in the results they can produce, not just kind of a, a singular output um, from, from the models there. Okay, so finally, on to the model itself. This is a very brief introduction to convolutional neural networks or CNNs. Um, the image you're seeing here is a diagram of the model that we used. Uh, one of the first layers is the, I'm sorry, the first layer is the input. The second layer here is the convolutional layer, followed by something called a max pooling layer, which all feeds into these fully connected layers down here. Uh, now I'm going to go through how these convolution layers work, and then I'll briefly describe the max pooling piece. And finally, we'll get to how the probabilistic, how we get a probabilistic output uh, from this type of model. Okay, so this is what an input to a two-dimensional convolution layer can look like. Uh, this is a toy array I made for the demonstration purposes here, um, but in our real arrays, the columns would represent an individual parameter like solar wind velocity, density, et cetera, and the rows would represent the time dimension. So Vx uh, at t minus one, Vx at t minus two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in our model, these uh, arrays are much bigger. I'll show you one uh, a little bit later on, but this is just for kind of uh, demonstration purposes, of course. Uh, so the way the convolution layer works is through the use of uh, these things called filters. Now, these are basically just weight matrices that are seeking to identify particular features in the input array. The way it does this is by taking a segment of the input array, uh, taking the dot product of the elements in that little window, uh, which is the little red you know, square up there, um, and adding a bias term, that's this B in the equation down here. Uh, this total then goes through some sort of activation function. The one we're using here is uh, a very common one called the rectified linear unit or ReLU activation, which is linear for positive terms uh, and it changes all of the negative terms to zero. All right, so I will walk through a quick example of like the practical way that this works. Um, so looking at the first window in red on the left over here, if we apply the dot product to the elements in that window, this is what we get. Uh, the bias term here, we'll just set it at one. This could be a lot of different you know, values, obviously, and this is a trainable parameter that the model learns, as is the weight matrix. Um, and now all of this, if you do the math, it outcome, or outputs to a five, and a five is obviously positive. So it passes through the ReLU function unchanged. Uh, and that's all, that's pretty much it. The result of five goes to this position in the output array for this convolutional layer. 
We then repeat this process uh, after sliding the window over. Uh, this time we get a value of four. So again, this bias term calling at one right here. This is the dot product of this weight matrix with this window or the elements in this window. Uh, and the four goes to this position in the output array. And if we do this for the entire input array, we get something that looks like this. This process would be repeated for a different filter with different values of the weight matrix and the resulting output arrays would kind of be stacked together. Uh, the number of filters you end up using is a hyperparameter that can be detuned. We ended up using 128 for our work here. Uh, and you can also uh, tune for the size of the window and how much it slides every time and a bunch of other uh, different parameters in here. Uh, now, there's a lot of this we could do differently. We could use different activation functions, et cetera. Um, but one of the more important things we can add uh, has to do with the difference in the dimensions between our input and the final output arrays of this layer. If you notice these two previous slides, that filter matrix will operate on the elements of the input array different numbers of times depending on their location in the array. It will hit the elements in the middle of the array four times, but the ones on the side only twice and the ones in the corners only once. Uh, this can result in a de-emphasis on the values in these elements, on the sides and in the corners especially. Um, and over time, because of the reduction in dimension between the input and the output arrays, the unintentional loss of uh, information as the array kind of shrinks as it goes through, especially if there are multiple convolutional layers being applied and this happens over and over again. So to prevent this, we can utilize a method called padding. Um, this is the original array that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and the padding is the uh, zeros on the top and bottom over here. Um, and padding, yeah, is just that. It adds rows and columns of zeros around the input array um, before it goes through the convolution process. The filter matrix then passes over this layer of zeros like normal elements of the input array and more equally captures the elements of the edges and the corners. Um, this either retains the initial dimensions of the input array, if you use two additional rows or columns of zeros, or actually increases the dimensions if a full boundary is used. Uh, in reality, the padding wouldn't look exactly like this. There would need to be rows attached to the top and bottom, or columns to the left and right, uh, if only two padding elements are being used. But in this very specific setup, it would turn the resulting array from the previous slide into an array that looks like this. Okay. Uh, that is the basics of a convolutional layer. Um, let me move on now to the max pooling layer here. Um, these layers are fantastic. Uh, they will often follow a convolutional layer uh, in these types of networks, and they serve a few different really important purposes. Um, so whereas before, when we were using padding to not unintentionally lose information during the convolution layer, here we are intentionally destroying information. Um, all it does is use the same type of windowing that was used in the convolution layer, but instead of doing any sort of dot product and applying an activation function, it simply takes the maximum value from within the window, this little red window, the maximum value there is five, so it just takes that value out. Uh, this seeks to pull out the most prominent features in or from the convolutional layer, uh, and it also drastically improves the computational performance because, as you can see, you can reduce this 4x4 four four array down to a 2x2 two two array if you slide that uh, window over uh, not just once but twice. So it would be a window here and then a window here getting these, these kind of uh, results for this 2x2 two two array. Uh, and this still while reducing the dimensions, retains the most prominent features from that convolutional process, like I said. Uh, there's other types of pooling, like average pooling, which takes the average in a window instead of the maximum, but those have been shown to not improve the performance of the models as much as these max pooling layers have. Um, so that's what we use here. All right, so those layers are quite simple, but quite powerful. So in our network, uh, we've done the convolution reduce the dimensions while still retaining the most prominent features using the max pooling layer. And then the resulting array gets fed into these fully connected layers to get our final output. So in order to do that, the two dimensional output from the max pooling layers that I showed you in the previous, or not previous, two previous slides ago, uh, is first flattened into a one dimensional array. And that array is then fed into these fully connected layers, which apply weight matrices, activation functions, and biases to produce a final output. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much depth on how these layers work. If you're really interested, 
Uh, Connor O'Brien from BU gave another early career seminar in this series last year where he goes through these types of networks in some detail. And I would heavily encourage you to check that out if you are uh, curious about how these work. They are quite fascinating. Um, but the important part of this that I will note is this final output layer. So our final output layer has two nodes, one to handle each of these specific binary classifications that we're looking at here. Uh, each of these nodes corresponds to one of two possible outcomes, the zero node up top corresponding to a no threshold crossing event and the one node to a crossing event. Uh, now these nodes can output any sort of number based on the results from the previous parts of the network. So here, let's say that the zero node outputs a five and the one node outputs a nine. So we can say that the model here thinks uh, that there's more of a likelihood that there will be a crossing than not, but it's kind of a little bit difficult to tell how much so because these numbers are relatively close to each other, right? Uh, we can then use another type of activation function on this final layer, which normalizes the outputs of each of these nodes, this five and this nine, to sum to one. This activation is called softmax activation, and it turns the outputs of five and nine into 0 0.018 for the zero node and 0 0.982 uh, for the one node. Uh, this looks like the model is far more confident that there will be a threshold crossing than it did when it was outputting a five and a nine. And because the outputs of the two nodes sum to one, we can interpret them as sort of a probability of that node occurring. Uh, as a note, when I show the outputs of the models in the next slides, those will be only the outputs of the positive node here corresponding to the threshold crossings. That's just uh, how we set up the data and things like that. Um, but yes, this is a very, very brief explanation of how these models uh, work. Um, it is a fairly shallow network as these things go. Sometimes you can have you know tons of convolutional layers and a lot more fully connected layers than I have here. Um, but as you'll see in a moment, it still performs rather well. Uh, okay, so we've done the introduction, we've done the methodology. Let's get on to some of the fun results here. So this is the model's performance on one of our test storms, the St. Patrick's Day storm of 2015. And let me talk you through what we're looking at here, because I know this is a relatively uh, complicated plot. Uh, each of these panels are the results for one of the magnetometer stations, and these are just four of them. I'll show you the other four in a moment. Uh, it's just tough to squeeze all eight on a single slide without it looking uh, even worse than it currently does. Uh, the red line in each of the panels is the mean of the solar wind only model ensemble, and the blue line is the combined model uh, ensemble mean. Uh, the light red and light blue shading around those lines is the 95th percentile. The black bar at the top of each panel is the ground truth data. So if it's present, then there is a threshold crossing in the future time window. And the green bar is the uh, persistence forecast uh, that I explained earlier. Uh, the gray shaded areas here are just air some of the areas we highlighted for a paper we published on this work uh, not too long ago. Um, and I'll highlight uh, specifically this section in just a moment. Um, but as you can see, the overall uh, models, do, they do relatively well. We're seeing a lot of these higher probabilities when the ground truth is positive. Uh, and, you know, areas like this where it's very, very low when there's no uh, threshold crossing in that future window. Uh, block C here is particularly interesting um, because during the latter parts of the storm, the solar wind model begins to underpredict the combined models quite a bit uh, when the ground truth is still positive. Uh, and I'll show you in a different way in more or more detail in a in a moment why we can uh, or how we can kind of dissect this a bit. Uh, this trend is seen across a majority of the test storms as the solar wind variables uh, begin to return to their baseline values. Those models begin to underpredict uh, the combined models during that ground truth time. Uh, and during the recovery phase of the storm right here, uh, the crossings become more intermittent and both models capture some of the crossings, uh, again, with the solar wind models, mostly under predicting still the combined models here. Uh, okay, and then here are the other four stations during the same storm. And we can see that many of the same trends as before are occurring here, although in block C, it's a little bit less uh, obvious. Uh, you can see these two big spikes in the model's output in the beginning. Uh, now, for these magnetometers, these mostly don't correspond to actual threshold crossings like they did for some of the previous stations. Uh, as I'll be able to show you in a moment, these spikes are driven by solar wind data, which is why we see such large spikes for all of the stations, uh, because it's kind of they're all taking in the same data and then showing those big spikes. Uh, 
so yes, these are some of the outputs, but we want to certainly be able to dive deeper into what is driving these results, what is causing these models to uh, output these. Uh, and so for that, we turn to the use of a model interpretability technique called SHAP values. Uh, and here is where I almost feel like I should have included uh, Dong Lai Ma in the list of contributors to this talk because he gave an absolutely fantastic overview of how these models work in last week's seminar. So for the sake of saving some time here, I'm going to refer you to his talk for a more detailed explanation. And I'll just say here as a reminder that the SHAP values are a way of determining the marginal contribution of each of the input parameters to the model's final output. And they're based on something called Shapley values developed in the field of game theory back in the 50s. Uh, these SHAP values were first introduced in this paper by uh, Lundberg and Lee at the University of Washington back in 2017. Uh, this paper really is a great read. I would highly recommend it uh, for anybody who's interested in machine learning in general. Uh, and it does focus a little bit more on the problem of making these values efficient to compute, which kind of makes sense since they're really trying to solve uh, this N hard problem. Uh, so if you want to read about the Shapley values themselves, I would refer you to this paper, which first uh, introduced them back in the 50s. Uh, again, this is a game theory paper, which was a little intimidating to me at first, but it is really well written, really intelligible, uh, and it's really digestible. Um, so I would also recommend it. Uh, it's a really good, really good paper to go through. Um, but this, for an example, is what the SHAP values look like for an individual array from one of our test storms. This is the size of the actual array for the combined model, a lot bigger than that example one I had shown you earlier. But again, the columns are are uh, are the different variables uh, that we have input into the model, and the rows are the time history. Um, so actually, the y-axis here is inverted. t minus 1 would be this first row here, t minus 2, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up. Uh, each of the elements in the array has a shaft value. That's what the color coding is here. The bluer values push the model's output downward towards zero. They are contributing to the model being more suppressed. And the redder values increase the model's output. Now we can create these SHAP values for every input array, for every test storm, for every station, for all 100 models in the ensembles, for both types of models. Uh, but that would be quite computationally expensive. So instead, we took 10 random models from the ensembles for each station and storm and averaged the resulting SHAP arrays to produce one SHAP array for each time step, for each station, for each testing storm, for each type of model. I really just cut out the 100 different ensembles there and turned it into 10 um, to make it a little bit more digestible. Uh, so to make these SHAP arrays a little bit more intuitive, we also had to destroy a little bit more information by summing the SHAP values along this time dimension. Don't point at the screen, Mike, that nobody can see that but you. So we sum along this time dimension, uh, and we get the results here. So this, this is the sum of the SHAP values for each parameter. So we only get one value for each array for each parameter. We can then take that resulting array uh, of some SHAP values and normalize them to a percentage contribution, which can be positive for values that are increasing the model's output and negative for parameter values that are suppressing the output. And if we stack all of these percent contributions on top of each other in a time series, we can get a plot that looks like this. So these are the SHAP percentage contributions for the solar wind only model for the LER station during the 2015 St. Patrick's Day storm. Each of the colors you see here corresponds to a different input parameter, and the black bar up top is again the ground truth uh, crossing data. A few things you can see right off the bat here. One, the biggest positive contributor to these spikes at the beginning of the storm is this purple parameter here, uh, which is the solar wind density. Uh, and if you go into the solar wind data, you can see a significant increase in the parameter at this time. So this method is also just very good at uh, pointing me in the right direction to figure out what's going on in the solar wind data instead of going through plot after plot after plot. Um, it's been very helpful in that way. Uh, Yes, okay. And then at the beginning of this more continuous uh, period of crossings, we see the contributions from almost all of the parameters dramatically increase. Uh, and during the main phase of the storm, this dark green parameter here, which is IMFBZ, uh, seems to be the most dominant, which we would kind of expect given its importance in facilitating dayside reconnection and the particle transport towards the night side. Uh, 
Uh, during this grayed out block C right here, we can also see how these parameters, positive contributions, all really begin to drop off as the solar wind parameters begin to return to their baseline levels as we enter the beginning of that recovery phase of the storm. Uh, though this light green parameter here, which is Vx, uh, the x component of solar wind velocity, pushes the model up significantly during that recovery phase as it actually remains kind of elevated during this time. Moving to the same plot for the combined model, we can see the addition of the magnetometer parameters has a pretty significant effect. Uh, first, we can see that these spikes at the beginning are still caused by the solar wind density, um, showing that the model is still strongly influenced by the solar wind parameters, uh, though the spike here is dampened much more quickly than it was in the previous slide. Uh, the first spike during the continuous period of threshold crossings is still dominated by the solar wind parameters, as we would kind of expect, given that the solar wind monitors would provide more warning of significant incoming events, so we do kind of expect that, and that's good. Um, but during the main phase of the storm, we can still see the shape of the positive contributions of all of these solar wind parameters, um, but they are significantly reduced compared to the other slide. Uh, and that magnitude is mostly taken over by these cyan parameters. The dark cyan is the ground magnetic field data, and the light cyan is the DVDT data. Uh, and then in the latter half of the main phase of this storm during the block C here, we can see that as the solar wind parameters drop off like they did in the previous slide, that column is really taken up by these uh, ground magnetometer parameters, uh, which keep the model elevated for a longer period of time here. Uh, all right, so these are the slides I was going to skip if I'm running out of time, which it looks like I am. So I'm gonna zoom past these. Um, and all right, so if we, switch our perspective here a little bit and look at the percent contributions as a function of the input parameters. These are some of the parameters for the solar wind only model, right? So each of these different plots is a solar wind parameter with the percent contributions uh, on the y-axis and the parameters values on the x-axis. Uh, so I should uh, actually, no, I'll, I'll skip that for uh, the sake of time here. Um, but yes, at a glance, we can see that these plots are kind of conforming to uh, the understanding that we currently have of the solar wind magnetosphere system. Uh, if we look at BZ, this top right panel over here, we can see that around its mean value close to zero, uh, the majority of the points are negatively contributing. So during quiet time, uh, if these are pushing the model's outputs down towards zero, which we would expect. Uh, and as the values get more negative, we see larger positive contributions. Uh, a similar phenomenon can be seen here in the VX data, where during its you know, uh, average kind of quiet time values of between four and 500 kilometers per second, the contributions are mostly negative and they positively increase as VX increases. These are the values uh, for the combined model, and we can see similar shapes for the solar wind uh data um but the output or the magnitudes are, are suppressed because a lot of that is taken over by the magnetometer parameters here and here you can really see just how dominant for these models the bh and dbdt are um but again they are conforming to what we would hope they would because at close to zero where they are during most of the you know uh quieter times uh they're negatively contributing to the model's output and they increase as those values increase as well um, so this is all good, but we need to uh, find a way to qualitatively tell how our models are performing instead of just this kind of qualitative uh, overview of them. So to do that, we've calculated a variety of metrics, a few of which I'll display here. Um, this type of binary classification typically employs slightly different metrics than a regression problem would, and many of these metrics utilize something called a confusion matrix. Um, but all this is is a way to compare the actual and the predicted binary values, and it counts up these true positives when the actual value is positive and the predicted value is also positive, false positives, false negatives, true negatives, et cetera. And we can combine these values uh, in a bunch of different ways to describe our model's performance. So for instance, we can use the true and false positives to calculate the precision. Uh, we can use the true positives and false negatives to calculate the recall. Um, and we can use a bunch of the, or all of the elements of the confusion matrix to calculate the high key skill score or HSS. Uh, this just compares our model's results to a random chance model, basically. There's another metric we'll use here, which does not use the elements of this confusion matrix. This is the Breyer score, which is essentially the mean squared error for probabilistic binary predictions. Uh, 
Uh, and we can also turn this Breyer score into a skill score by comparing our model with a reference model, which I'll show you in a few moments. Um, so this is uh, a few of the metrics, but it's certainly not all of them. In fact, even choosing which metrics to calculate is a topic of kind of current debate. Uh, I'm personally on the side of just calculate all of them, but for a much more nuanced discussion than that, I would encourage you all to check out Steve Morley's talk from the seminar series, uh, or to check out this paper by Michael Lamone, both of which dive deep into the topic of metrics. Um, okay, so the first metric score I'll talk about is actually a combination of the two of the scores I just showed you. The area under the precision recall curve, as the name might suggest, plots the precision versus the recall metrics, and then calculates the area underneath the curve created by interpolating between these points. It does this by sweeping a threshold line over the results and calculating the precision and recall values for each unique value output by the model. Um, let me do a quick demonstration of how this works. Um, so if we set a line in one of our result plots here, let's say we set it right here, uh, everything above this line is now counted as a positive prediction and everything below the line a negative prediction. So for this specific line, we might expect a point on the precision recall plot to be somewhere around here. Since the recall should be relatively high, since the line is closer to zero and there shouldn't be too many false negatives and the precision might be lower because the low line would create more false positives. Uh, we then move the line to say here and recalculate the scores and do this again and again. And then we interpolate uh, between those points uh, and the area under that curve is our score. That's the area under the precision recall curve. Uh, like I said, in reality, we would have many more than four points of these. They would look a lot more like this. Um, so these are the precision recall curves for one of the combined models at the ESK station. Each of the colors represents a different one of the test dorms. And as you can see, uh, there are significantly more points in these curves than the one I just showed you. Uh, now, a perfect score here is one, which is, uh, I don't believe, ever actually achievable due to the exponential in the softmax activation asymptoting above the zero line. Um, but these scores are well above what a random model would produce, which is approximately the ratio of positive ground truth values for a storm, uh, which for all of these is somewhere between 0.15 and 0.25. Uh, I should note here that recently uh, something has been drawn to my attention by Christian Lau from UCL, uh, who told me about something on these curves that need to be calibrated, uh, which I have not addressed in any of this work just yet, but it has to do with this area of unattainability on these curves. So if uh, these area under the precision recall curve scores were calibrated, uh, then they would probably be ever so slightly worse. I haven't done the full calculations yet, um, but they could be worse by about somewhere in the 0.05 range from what I can tell. This is the paper that Christian showed me. And again, very good read, very intelligible uh, for anybody that's interested in metrics. So feel free to add that to the pile. But without further ado, especially because I, oh yeah, I'm running out of time here. These are some of the results uh, for two of the metric scores. The blue shaded ones are the precision recall metrics. The dark blue is the results for the combined model. The lighter blue is the solar wind only model. And these blue triangles are the results that would uh, come from a persistence forecast. Uh, the dot in the middle of these predictions is the mean for all of the ensemble. And then the error bars are the 95th percentile. The red values are uh, of a similar pattern for the high key skill scores. Um, again, with the dark red uh, being the combined model uh, and then lighter red, the solar wind only model. Um, as you can see, the uh, combined models are all outperforming both the solar wind only models and the um, persistence forecast, which is great. That was kind of what we were hoping for. Uh, and the precision recall curves are all quite high. Again, they would be slightly lower if completely calibrated using that method that Christian showed me. And then um, the high key skill scores are also quite high, showing that they're at least much better than a random chance model, which is great. These are the Briar score, or the Briar skill scores. Uh, and as a reminder for this score, we calculated the uh, Briar scores for our models and a reference model and compared the results. A perfect score here would be one. Uh, and as a reference model, we use both the persistence model uh, and a climatology uh, value, um, which is just the ratio of positive to negative ground truth for each of the storms. Uh, and overall, again, our machine learning models are outperforming both of these types of models, which is great. 
Um, so that's all from me. Uh, this is a summary, which I'm just going to skip through here real quick, as I am some of the future work. Um, this is the paper we published on a lot of this work that goes into far more detail than I had time to hear. Uh, and then this is a link to the uh, GitHub page um, where that paper is stored, all of the work for this, all of the code for this is stored, and are these uh, slides stored as well. Um, I think they are out of order compared to what I just showed you, but I will fix that soon. So yes, that is all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for a great talk. Uh, I think you covered that in really good detail and quite clearly. Um, we do have a couple questions. Uh, there's one from Eric Lund on slide 29. Yes, let me reshare my slides, sorry. Okay, sorry, 29, you said. Yeah, regarding the uh, convolutional neural network. And that's yeah. Something. Yeah. Uh, so here in this example is the reason for sliding by two rows by two col columns is that the convolution array is a two by two? Uh, no, oh, well, uh, you mean the, so like here, you slide from this section to this section. Um, you don't have to do that because it's a two by two. That's that's pretty common because you don't want to completely overlap all of these. But that's why I did it to just reduce the dimensions like that um, to make it a little bit more computationally efficient. Um, but you can do you can do a lot of different things with this. Um, it really depends. There's a lot of hyperparameter tuning you can do in all of these models. Um, it gets a little tricky sometimes because there's almost like, you know, not an infinite number of things you can try, but quite a large amount of things you can try. Um, and this is a little bit more standard because, yeah, exactly uh, kind of what you suggested there, Eric. It's uh, sliding by the window itself um, to not overlap. So, yeah, that's why I did it. Cool. Um, so I have a question about the convolutional neural network here, too, uh, mm -hmm. when you were showing, showing your padding. Um, mm -hmm. So... The CNNs, they're typically um, used for images. Mm -hmm. uh, here you're using it for time series data. Uh, mm -hmm. So rather than padding, because you mentioned that you can lose some data there, um, what about um, randomizing the columns in each ensemble? Uh, since the columns aren't images, they don't need to be stored in the same way that an image data needs to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. So in each model, if you randomize the columns, you might be able to reduce that bias um, without the need for padding, um, especially since you have 100 ensembles there. That might help, even though I guess the number of columns you have is still larger than 100. Yeah, it, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, that is something we've considered, and that's something I think we'd like to try doing kind of in our group. It's something we've discussed uh, doing it that way instead of this way. Um, even if we did randomize the columns, because it could affect the kind of output because of the because of the max pooling and the the way the convolution works, um, adding the padding doesn't add a ton of like computational time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, if we did that, we would still probably do both just to ensure that you know we're not losing any of the additional information. But that is that is definitely something we've considered. I think I think uh, we'll be doing that quite soon. Okay, cool, excellent. Uh, so we don't have any other questions today, um, and we are just over time. Uh, so I want to thank you again for a really great talk. Uh, I think this follows on quite nicely from the last couple of talks we've had. Uh, and I also want to thank you for sharing the paper and your GitHub. Um, yeah. So if you do go to the paper on uh, in Space Weather, which is in the chat now, uh, you can get into the uh supplementary material which links to mike's uh code as well as his github that helped produce all of this uh so thank you again for a really great talk mike and thank you see everyone next week